In the previous screencast, we motivated dynamic programming by showing how subproblems can be redundant and how we can exploit this redundancy for efficiency gains. We did this with a simple dynamic programming problem, the cut rod example. In this screencast, we're going to look at a more complex example, finding the longest common subsequence of two strings. Although it is necessary to work through examples to understand dynamic programming, there is also danger of getting lost in the details because problems amenable to dynamic programming can involve tedious computations, and these computations differ between problems. So we're going to begin by summarizing the problem-solving pattern common to all of these examples in the form of four steps that we'll then follow with the LCS example. And the images for this screencast come from the island of Kauai, specifically the coast just east of Poipu, a very nice coastal trail. But before we get into the details of the steps, let's note the conditions under which dynamic programming applies. First of all, you need to have a recursive decomposition of your problem. You need to be able to solve the big problem by breaking it down into smaller problems and solving them. And in this respect, it's similar to divide and conquer. But unlike divide and conquer, you want to have overlapping subproblems. This is where a subproblem is repeated, so it's worthwhile saving a solution and looking it up later, and that will lead to efficiency gains. Dynamic programming is characterized by the use of tables that are custom designed for a problem for recording the optimal solution to problems of smaller sizes. And the third characteristic is that it has optimal substructure. And it's related to the idea of recursive decomposition, but it's the specific property that any optimal solution must be broken down into subproblems for which the solutions to them are also optimal. Because that's going to allow you to do your recursive solutions independently of each other and then reuse them and know you can recombine them into the solution to the larger problem. So the steps for problem solving with dynamic programming that were implicit in the previous example and that we're going to follow more explicitly now with the LCS example are these four. First, you need to analyze your problem in terms of the characteristics that were just discussed. You need to show or find a recursive decomposition that has overlapping subproblems so that dynamic programming will have an efficiency gain. And you need to show that the decomposition you chose has optimal substructure. A common way of doing this in a proof is you, to assume that you have an optimal solution and then show that your decomposition does lead to optimal substructure. That's commonly done with the cut and paste proof where you say if it wasn't optimal you could plug in an optimal solution to the subproblem and improve the global solution. In order to find redundancy sometimes it's useful to write a brute force solution and observe the redundancies there and that will also tell you about what kind of decomposition you want that will take advantage of the redundancies. So an example here was when we first looked at the, the cuts into smaller rods and showed that the optimal solution to the smaller rods contribute to the optimal solution to the overall problem. Next, the only way our program is going to know that one solution is better than an, another is to have some way of computing the value of, of a solution. And so what we're going to do here is recursively define the value of a solution with some recursive cost function like we did here with the recurrence relation for the uh, cut rod problem. And in writing that recursive cost function, it will, it will re reflect the problem decomposition that we found to work in the first step up here. And it will give us guidance in how to write the code. The third step then, of course, is applying that, uh, writing the code to compute the recursive values. In, in other words, operationalizing this, the formula that you found into code. And that code will either use memoization or it'll small, solve smaller subproblems first in the bottom-up approach, such as we did in the bottom-up cut rod. And it'll do so in a manner that re avoids redundant computation. It will use tables to record the cost of the smaller solutions so you can then compose them into the cost of larger solutions. Finally, once you've got this recursive code that builds larger solution values out of smaller solution values, you've got a uh, augment that code with, with whatever is needed to construct the optimal solution itself. And so often we'll see in dynamic programming there's extra annotations or parallel tables that record what the choice was made that led to an optimal solution. So now let's look at this in action. 
Here we enter the example of the longest common subsequence. So what is a longest common subsequence? Well, first of all, let's say we're going to write sequences. Well, a sequence can be a string, you know, such as A, B, C, D, like that. But we're also going to write them using angle brackets, like that. So a subsequence of a sequence leaves out zero or more elements. So let's say we want to make a sequence SP, which consists of the prime elements in this list here. So it has the, the items in order, but leaves out some of them. Now to speak of a common subsequence, uh, we need to have two sequences here, so let me write another one. So there is a, another sequence, and if this here is, um, if x is sp and y is so for odd, the subsequence uh, z of those two would be the elements that they have in common in order. And it is the longest common subsequence if it's a subsequence of maximal length, which is the example I've just drawn here. One that is not, of course, would be if I had left off the 7. So we can now state the longest common subsequence problem as the problem of given two sequences, finding a subsequence common to both whose length is the longest. This problem is found in areas such as bioinformatics. If you have sequenced the DNA of multiple organisms and you want to compare, for example, how similar two species are, and you want to find sequences of their DNA that are in common with each other, and so you take the four amino acid letters and you make strings out of them and then you try to find matches. And here are some rather simpler examples. Uh, what do springtime and pioneer have in common? Pine. Horseback and snowflake? Oak. And you can see where that's going. Let's start our analysis of the problem by looking at a brute force algorithm for solving the problem. So suppose we have two subsequences, x and y, and x is of length m and y is of length n. So a brute force approach would be to check every possible subsequence of x and check whether it's a subsequence of y. Well, how many subsequences of x are there? This is what's called the power set. For every member of this sequence, we have the either choice to include it or not to include it. So for example, the first one, there's two choices, include or not include. The second one, two choices, that's two times two times two times two. So it's actually two to the m possible subsequences to check. That's a lot already. But then we also have to take each of those two to the m subsequences and start iterating through the characters of y to see does the first one match, does the second one match, does the third one match. And so we get this horrible theta of n for the length of y, 2 to the m for x brute force solution. And the crucial observation not only is that brute force is bad, so we shouldn't use it, but why is it bad? What is the redundant work being done? Well, the redundant work is being done because it's not taking advantage of matches of prefixes. If a sequence uh, subsequence z of x fails to match y, then any subsequence having z as a prefix will also fail. You know, so for example, we have x is equal to a, b, c, d, and y is a, f, c, d. And then suppose we match the subsequence of x a, b to y and it fails to match. There's no point of going on and then checking a, b, c, a, b, c, d against y. They're all going to fail too because this prefix failed. So we're going to structure our solution to take advantage of the fact that once a prefix fails, you don't have to go any further. But we're going to flip this reasoning. We're going to say if z is an LCS of x and y, then all the prefixes of z must also be LCSs of the prefixes of x and y. That's going to be a way of breaking down the problem. So the first step is to show that our problem has an optimal substructure. And I want you to notice that here we do something interesting. Normally we would be inclined to say, well, we're trying to solve a problem, so what can we do to piece together a solution to the problem? And the solution comes at the end. But what we do in analyzing the optimal substructure of a problem is we assume that we have the solution and then we reason about what we must have done to get there. And that reasoning tells us how to get there, how to construct the code to get there. So in terms of the LCS problem, we're going to assume that we have an optimal solution, z, 
and being optimal means it is a longest common subsequence of x and y. And then we're going to show that the problem breaks down such that either z or one of its prefixes must be an optimal solution to a subproblem where we chop off character of x or y, shorter strings. So let's assume that z is an LCS of x and y and then look at some cases here. If the last character of x and y is the same, or the last item in the sequence, then it must be the case that the last character of z is also that same character or item in the sequence. Why? Well, if it wasn't, we could make z longer by adding that last character. So then z would not be a longest common subsequence. There would be some uh, z, z of k plus this other character would be a longer common subsequence. So that would be a contradiction. And furthermore, that means we can chop off that last character off of each of the, the two problem input strings and z the LCS. And it must be the case that z of k minus 1 is an LCS of those other two subproblems, or this subproblem consisting of these other two strings. Proof there would be con by contradiction. If instead of z there were some other string w that was a longer common subsequence of x minus 1, m minus 1, and y n minus 1, then we could add that last character to w, and we would get an, an LCS of the original x and y that would be longer than z of k, and that would be a contradiction. These next two parts of the theorem both have the same precondition. If the last character of the prefix x of m and y of n are not the same, then if the last character of z is not equal to the last character of x, then z has to be an LCS of x m minus 1, in other words the prefix with that last character removed, and y. Because some character in this prefix of x must match the last character of z as well as some character in y. And symmetrically, if the last character of z is not equal to the last character of y, then z must be an LCS of x and y minus 1 because the last character of z must match something in the prefix y of m minus 1 because it doesn't match the last one. And of course, if you put these two together, if the last character of z doesn't match either the last character of x or the last character of y, then z must be an LCS of both x of n minus 1 and y of n minus 1. That's not written down here. You could write it out as case 4, but it's already implicit in these other two here. So I've given the proof uh, informally in my, in my explanation and argumentation along the way. You can read it more formally in the textbook. What we've accomplished here is we've shown that an LCS of two sequences contains as prefix an LCS of prefixes of the two sequences. So this optimal substructure is what enables us to now write the recursive formulation of the value of a solution. We're going to write out a formula, a recursive formula for the value Cij, which will be the length of the LCS of prefixes xi of x and uh, yj of y. So we're going to translate this theorem into the uh, formula giving the definition of C. Let's first deal with the base case. If either of these strings are empty, which means if i equals 0 or j equals 0, then, of course, the length of the prefix is 0. Now let's look at the case here, where we had the last two characters of these strings match. And so here we're going to look at the case where both i and j are greater than 0, and their last characters match. In that case, we need to count 1 for that character, and we need to recursively invoke the cost or the value of the uh, recursive solution for the prefixes of both of these strings. We've chopped off the one matching character. So it's going to be whatever the optimal solution is for c i minus 1, j minus 1, because we've chopped off that character off of both of them, plus 1 for the character that we just included. Now the third case is where the last character of these prefixes xi and xj, uh, yj, 
do not match. But we don't know which way it's, it's going to be a better solution, an optimal solution. And this is a typical thing in dynamic programming. Again, we're going to use the max to say, let's check out both solutions, pick the max. So we don't know whether it's going to be the case that we get the better, the, the longer common s sequence with taking a character off of X and keeping Y, or taking a character off of Y and keeping X. But first, let's write the condition. This is where those two characters do not match. That's the same as before, but now their last character do not match. So here is where we need to find the max. And I need to make some more room here. So this is where we chop off one character of x. This is the case 2 here, but we keep y the same length, so we just leave j alone. And this, of course, is the case where we leave x alone and we take off one character of y. To solve both subproblems, the prefix of one string, the prefix of the other string, find the max. OK, and in the end, we want to find CMN. So here we've turned a theorem that says if we have an optimal solution, it must have this substructure into an equation that says here's the value of any subproblem, including up to the problem we want to solve, based in terms of its subproblems. So this equation is a lot closer to something we can program. It's a recursive structure, and we can write code that mirrors this structure. But I want you to appreciate that this this equation did come directly out of the, the theorem. Well, that's plenty for one screencast. Let's take a little pause here at this point for a little fishing break. And then in the next screencast, we'll see how we can pull this off with code.